thank you. So thank you for, very much for the invitation. Uh, well, the first thing, uh, we want to present ourselves. And uh, I, I'll try to make the, uh, the talk short enough so you can have time for questions afterwards. Uh, basically, uh, Serendipia is a very young startup. We've been around for less than two years, and we are very much focused on deep learning techniques. So our aim, we come from you know, this typical background in data scientists coming from PhD on computer science and artificial intelligence. Uh, we got together, we, we have been working in different domains like consultancy firms uh, and other technological firms um, and also startups. Uh, so we decided to you know, start our own uh, business plan. So basically we are doing um, professional services oriented around deep learning, and we're not talking about any of that today, okay? So if you have any question about that, yeah, we can talk about that later. Uh, because the other thing that we like to do is research and, uh, you know, the innovation in the sense that we don't see actually a business model behind yet. So also, if you see some business model for this, we're happy to hear about that. <laughs> because we don't see, well, we have problems seeing that. So uh, this talk is very much focused on, you know, innovations in this, in this area of, you know, preventing uh, online harassment. And that's what we're doing and how we can use AI for, for that, okay? So I will be doing the uh, talking now and uh, in the, during the question round, Jorge and I will be happy to take questions, okay? Uh, just one quick presentation about myself or, or the area in which we focus when we work with in this domain is that we want to be very cross-disciplinary. So the main focus for us is cognitive neuroscience. So of course, you know about AI because you're here, you know about yeah, big, da big data environments so on and so forth, a lot of uh, unstructured data, but we combine that with uh, you know, our experience in cognitive psychology and also neuroscience. So we try, uh, of course, there, these are levels, labels. Many people talk about this, but it's quite difficult. For my, my point of view, my experience coming from you know, computer science at the beginning and then from psychology, there is a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, a lot of, a, a great bridge between different realms. I mean, we, ha we are in different domains, we don't share, actually, there's, there's some talking about being multidisciplinary, but I don't see that very often, you know, happening in the real, uh, the real thing. So that's what we are trying to do. So, and for that, uh, I have kind of two parts of two blocks of this talk. So first one is about the problem domain. And that is very much related with the, the problem itself. I mean, uh, cognitive psychology, how people experience these problems of online harassment. And the second part is just, the, is now the more technical approach to that problem. But we really need to understand the problem first, okay? So, and actually I'll be talking a bit more, not, not just these two points, but of course it's uh, the funny thing. I, I think the important thing for a talk like this is that you have a feeling of how it, how it is working. So we will present how we have addressed the problem and how we are doing so far. So actually we are happy also to take any suggestions or critique or whatever you want to share afterwards. So online harassment, every one of you, I think more or less you know what that means. Uh, you can talk about harassment or, or abuse, many forms of it. And of course, uh, this is the world we live in. I mean, uh, you have the, uh, some of you, you are gamers, some of you uh, spend uh, three quarters of your life connected to social media. Some of you know, of course. Uh, messaging apps, blogging, blah, blah, blah. So uh, things that usually happened before this digital era, S some bad things or, and good things that happened in the offline work world now are happening also here. So, and we need to identify uh, what they are. And see, uh, for those of you who are like me, very techies, or, I mean, again, I'm a computer scientist. We really need to do a good work doing the engineering 
uh, requirements engineering. We really need to understand the problem. If you start coding, if you start uh, coding in Python to solve this problem, then you have a problem because you're not understanding what you're doing. That's why I'm, uh, uh, I'm you know, investing this time. So humiliation, threats, embarrassment, discredit, intimidation, extortion, stalking, impersonation. You are familiar with that? I hope, no, not very familiar, but you are familiar with that. I mean, you know what that means, right? Okay. Maybe you know it because you have suffered some of them. That's for sure. Maybe you know because you're a bully. I don't know. I can see your faces right now. Okay, we can settle down later. Okay. So, and the, the, the funny thing is, that everyone, everyone is involved here because sometimes we see these problems like being, you know, someone else's, and actually, uh, it involves. I mean, it's is how our society is evolving right now. So, yeah, of course, we many times talk about vulnerable groups. This is not a talk about vulnerable vulnerable groups because everyone is a target here. Everyone is a target as well as everyone is a potential, uh, you know, uh, offender in this case. So uh, it affects everyone. And of course, uh, yeah, and we have some responsibility here. Uh, sometimes we talk in this kind of conferences, we talk a lot about, te about technology and we're going to do that in about a minute. But again, it's important to see which, what is our responsibility as uh, you know experts in technology or implementators? We maybe maybe we are not policy makers, but we are you know the ones in charge of defining what technology is going to do. So we need to get in touch with this. That's something we cannot ignore. Basically, that's the point. So, oof, I'm not going to define all these things, right? It's uh, like that cloud kind of thing, just to, probably you're familiar with some of these terms. Others, uh, you can search now in Wikipedia. I'm not going through all of them, but the idea is, and the focus of this talk is how we can fight, fight this uh, phenomena. So one way to do that is focusing on language. Some of them, they have other components, of course. It's not all about mm, verbal communication, but le but language is quite, I mean, it's key, essential about, you know, because it's conveying meaning. And these uh, online harassment problems are related, very well related with meaning. So one has to under understand what meaning is about here. So uh, let's see so one example to clarify what we're talking about, right? And see the complexity about this. Okay, listen to, uh, maybe you know this movie. Ladies and gentlemen, electric cars, they're totally gay. It's true. I don't mean that they're homosexual gay, but I do mean your parents are the chaperone at the dance gay, right? You tuck it in and wear it real high gay. I don't want to disrespect anybody because I'm not about that, but I think we're understanding what we're trying to talk about here, right? I mean, honestly, the Nissan Spit, really? It screams this. Oh, here we go. The Hyundai, pomegranate, right? The Chevy, fingerprint. Now. Okay, I'm going to stop to, with the cat, <laughs> because it's uh, a cute cat. <laughs> okay, so you see what I mean? It's not easy, because maybe, I mean, uh, we're going to talk about supervised learning. You know, many of you are familiar with machine learning, deep learning techniques. We, we have unsupervised, supervised learning. This is a problem for super, supervised learning. And as you, many of you who, has, who have worked with uh, machine learning algorithms, you know how important is the training data set, right? And to have a good labeling or a good tagged uh, data set. But the problem with this is, what is correct here, what is not correct. And that's why I bring up the topic of political correctness is maybe uh, this, uh, you know, this scene was okay like a few decades ago, now it's not politically correct. And that is 
also not only dependent on time, but it's al also dependent from you know on different cultural backgrounds, etc. So it's quite difficult, even though you have uh, the right algorithm for this. The real challenge is probably in the domain of having appropriate uh, training data set or the supervisor. Who is the supervisor in this supervised learning? So that's why you know people like in, vanity, in this Vanity Fair article they are wondering: Are electric cars gay, or is Pins Bowen an idiot, or, or both? So it it sounds silly, but it's a really serious question because if you are to train a machine learning algorithm, what you need to know this. I mean, you need to solve this question. Otherwise, you're doing, you know, are you familiar with GIGO, gar garbage in, garbage out? You're doing a predictive model who, which takes garbage in and gives you garbage out. You know, trash, crappy thing, not valid. You're not doing your, your job. So, wow, that's the difficulty here is more on the data set. Uh, so, of course, politi uh, political correctness is something that is being solved by Trump, as you all know. Because, uh, for, for instance, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, playing this video, but uh, Trump has been criticized many times because he uses words like, or terms like, uh, anchor babies. Uh, and so he's saying, you know, uh, p political correctness is too slow for me. We don't have time for being politically correct. So that's why th that's one way to solve the problem. It's just, it's just saying, OK, I'm going to offend people, and I don't care. <laughs> that's one way to solve it. Yes, I, I throw it to you so, so, you, so, so you can uh, you know, think about it. Um, of course, and we come to the root problem. So we have language. Language is, uh, uh, is extraordinarily complex, and we have uh, infinite number of meanings, and we have to build a model which is able to comply with what we need to control or prevent, in this case, online harassment. Yeah? And, and it has many, many, many forms. And that's the, uh, the, the, you know, anchor babies, instead of saying, oh, the babies are immigrant mothers who are trying to take advantage of uh, birth, birth uh, right, nationality rights, you know, that's one thing. This is for those of you speaking Spanish, and that's the Google Translate version. And I will not, I'm not going to say it loud because, it's, yeah, it's not nice. Okay, but that's a that's a real that's taken from El Mundo newspaper yesterday. Okay, so so language problems with language appear uh, all the time, and we need some. Or we want to offer some AI solution for that. That's the key. Of course, non-verbal is important as well. But uh, in this case, we are, uh, we are focusing on language, but we know nonverbal communication is there as well, and we need to take care of that. But we will do later as we, we, we decided to focus first on verbal communication. So OK, let's go for the technical side of, the, of it. How, how, do we, uh, how do we solve this? Um, of course. Now, from the problem domain, the analysis of what is our problem, so our problem could be solved many ways. These are the ways that we came out, but probably you know others. I mean, people working with uh, in this area, probably they know other solutions. So one solution for me is forbidding online access. Like even for, forbidding online access even for, for children, uh, totally. So they are not exposed to potential threats or potential dangers. Uh, of course, as you know, uh, uh, as you may be thinking, we have to do some trade-off, and yeah, of course, we need to be in the online world. So it's nothing. That's not prob probably the way. So monitoring the communication. So monitoring, and I use the brackets for spying because uh, I can I cannot really see the difference between monitoring, tracking, and spying. Uh, one different and one thing it's important for us is like maybe if there is a machine who is monitoring your, the, the communication, and it's not another human, maybe that is not that intruding. At least for me, because I'm used, uh, to, I'm used to use Gmail, and I don't feel bad because some machines from Google are reading my emails. Mm, but that's me. I don't know. Um, 
So uh, more important is, you know, and having a, a moderator, so the supervisor, or in, in, in a, the case of vulner vulnerable groups like children, uh, of course, we can think about parents or educators or someone. But again, in the online world, we don't have the capacity to have humans taking care of that. That's why I, you know, I think we can think about AI solutions in terms of having some kind of bots or some automated way to do that but maybe in, in collaboration with humans. So think about here, I would tend to think more, not automating everything, but I'm kind of thinking more in a hybrid solution, like, you know, uh, collaboration between machines and fewer humans. So, uh, you know, uh, improving productivity while doing this. Um, and we come back again to the problem of uh, data set. I mean, what is the normative? What, what is the good training data set should we use? And that's, uh, again, the, the problem all the time. So, uh, of course, you know about uh, natural language processing. Here, we move to a more maybe appropriate uh, term or domain, which is natural language understanding, because we need to extract meaning. There is a lot of meaning, and all these uh, constructs that we were referring to before, uh, like in, you know, threats, insults, uh, being stalked, all this is conveyed in language in the form of meaning. So we need to extract that meaning in order to detect that this is uh, actually happening in, in a communication. So, yeah, I, if you want to see that from the point of view of pure analytics, we have a problem of classification, maybe some regressions, let's see. So uh, you are familiar probably with uh, sentiment analysis solution, uh, like, you know, classifying text uh, positive, negative, neutral, not valid enough for this. Yeah, that's clear. So, uh, so well, we are modeling this problem as a supervised learning problem, as we said before. Um, we need to, you know, categorize or classify uh, the text or the mm, comments or the documents with categorical labels. Uh, so we have a multi-label scheme in which we have this set of different, uh, I'd like to say constructs, constructs because they are, or you can call the traits or, you know, features. They are not features actually, they are more labels. So think about um, the parameters that we want to measure in online communication so we can detect online harassment in general, right? And we have many dimensions. So we, of course, we have a high dimensional input, which is language, really, really high dimensional input. And then also we have a multi-dimensional output. Uh, we have to deal with that, yeah? Um, and uh, also one thing I didn't mention is that we wanted to put a focus on Spanish language. Because we are Spanish, we work here, and we have the, you know, the Spanish-speaking community. With usually, uh, if you work in the area of natural language processing understanding, you know, English is usually the first option for people like Google or Facebook. Um, we have this other goal that having, you know, uh, a policy, a uh, Spanish-first policy, like Trump with you know, America first. We are Spanish-first. So we built a comment scraper with uh, Menea Menus Aggregator, and that's a nice place to have, you know, a good source of um, potentially toxic uh, comments, you know, all sorts of things. For instance, you have uh, news, and in this case, uh, this is also from yesterday, you have like 40 comments about it. Uh, all sorts of comments, uh, very complex, very a lot of uh, variability in, in data. Uh, wow, and then we have this, when I say wow, it's because I'm thinking from the computer science of it, the point of, point of view is, poof, that's a huge problem, high dimensionality again. Uh, a lot of questions to be solved uh, with uh, language. One of them is the unit, what, what statistics, statisticians, they call it uh, unit of analysis. What is my unit? What is my exemplar? If I'm doing, uh, you know, machine learning, a, a half pair X, Y, what, what is it? What is my X? Is, 
already a difficult question, even before you started to do any, any model training. Mm. And if you look at uh, actual real examples, and that's the, um, the idea here, to have an uh, actual product working in the real environment, you find in Meneame, you find things like this. And this, is, this could be the unit of analysis. And you, if you look at that, niños, mamá, Pedrito me ha llamado culo gordo. No le hagas caso, Pedrito, que es tonto. Y los adultos dicen, denuncia a la cárcel por, con él porque ha cometido un drrrr, delito de odio. Yeah, very, very, very difficult. Uh, sorry for the English speakers. <laughs> uh, okay, you didn't understand anything, but yeah. <laughs> yeah Google Slay. Google Lens. It's like <laughs> yeah. So, very difficult. I mean, you get it. It's quite difficult to decide how to oper operational. Oh, I don't say it. I, I cannot say that word. How to make this operational, right? It's very difficult. So, um, I don't know how many of you know traditional NLP, natural language processing techniques. I mean, I say traditional, I mean uh, count-based space, uh, space models. So, uh, uh, as you probably know, if you are familiar with machine learning, we always do the same. We take inputs, x, x1, x2, x3, x4, blah, blah, blah. We do maybe some pre-processing in order to get a feature vector. So, we describe the original raw input as features, and then we provide the predictive model with these features in order to do the prediction. That's the machine learning uh, original way. Of course, if you are very lazy and you like deep learning, you forget you have this dream, which is not realistic, of forgetting about feature extraction and providing the model directly with the access with the input, with the raw input, and you end up with things not working, most likely. Of course, it can be done, but it's much, much more difficult. And especially with language being such a complex domain, usually we end up doing feature extraction. Feature, we build the uh, feature vectors. So a traditional way in NLP to build um, uh, feature vectors is this bag of words, team TF, IDF, like Google is doing for many, many years, uh, one hop representations. I mean, if you are familiar with data science, you know these terms. If you're not, basically look at the picture and you have one and zeros, yeah. counting words. Bas really, ba in, in principle, very simple, but it, it might be very powerful, though, because you can do a very good uh, document classificator doing, using this, and it works. The problem is not versatile enough for, for what we want, because we really need to grasp the meaning here. You see, uh, the, the stress I, um, I, I put in the beginning, meaning is key here. It's not valid to do something like counting or detecting some keywords. Keyword-based uh, AI is not enough for this. So that's why we go for deep learning now. Of course, it's fashion these days, it's trend. We need to talk about deep learning. Okay, now we're doing it. <laughs> so instead of just uh, you know making advocacy for deep learning, let's just say we're changing the model from account-based uh, space model, in which we describe, we derive features from the text as count and as counting words. Instead of that, let's go for a neural representation learning. And deep learning is mostly about uh, representation learning. Uh, what does it mean? Representation learning, that's the important key here. Um, when you have a classical machine, uh, machine learning algorithm, you're actually focusing on Xs, inputs, and Ys, and outputs. And you learn some, some rules, and then you get your predictive model working, and that's nice. But here, but we put the uh, focus on what happening, what is happening in in the hidden layers. In in inside the model, there is some learning happening. That's why I use this illustration and you kind of reminding that it, we we humans we understand we have meanings for words and that is stored in our brains. So our brains have solved the problem of representing meaning of representing words. I don't know if you have given much thought about it. 
if you think now how your brain is storing words and meanings, how the word chair or the word screen or house is stored in your brain, is it one neuron? Is, it, is, is the house neuron and the cat neuron and the dog neuron? And then if you drink too much one night and you, uh, and you know when you drink alcohol, you're killing your neurons, right? Maybe your dog neuron is killed that night and you are not uh, able anymore to, see, to say dog. I don't know, that, is, that happened to you? Okay, I can see just one member of the audience. It happens. He's saying like, okay. <laughs> the others are not alcoholic yet. So good. <laughs> okay. So it's not that way. It's not working that way, of course. <coughs> so how it works. So that, that's a completely different talk, but I just wanted to show you some fancy pictures of fMRI because they are nice. It's really nice to see those brains with colors, right? It's, yeah. it's cool. It's kind of cool. Okay. Uh, but what's the, the real point here? Because we are not going to explain, oh, the broadcast area, blah, blah, blah. Basically, what we intuitively know is that the brain has a way, a more distributed way to store meaning, in, uh, not in one neuron, like this simple uh, example I was giving earlier, but using a distributed representation of words in neural tissue, in the nervous system. So the nervous system, is very effectively using a set of neurons or other cells in order to store a myriad of different meanings of words as a network. And that network, you could think about, okay, if I, as I'm an engineer now, you know, I, I forget for a moment that I'm a psychologist and I don't care about the pain of others. So as, as, as an engineer, the, my way to understand how the brain stores words is to open your skull, use a lot of micro electrodes. Uh, of course, you are killing the process, and it's messy, uh, but, but, but at least you get you know, a real reading of what's happening in your, in your brain. Probably you will be much distressed, and then the only word representing in your neurons is, oh, 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 I'm going to die, I'm going to die. But yeah. So very difficult to understand how brain does that, we don't know. But we have this intuition that the representation of words is done through a distributed, uh, very robust uh, representation, which could be translated into numbers. Imagine that, uh, you know, the brain is an uh, electronic system and it's working with impulses. So if we, can, if we could measure with these microelectrodes all the numbers about the how many mini balls are running through every synapse in your brain, in your language areas, when you are talking or where you un are understanding some messages, then that is what we are looking for. The uh, really good, nice, effective representation of meaning. And that is what we do in uh, deep learning using this yeah, now, I mean, from this, this is the famous paper from 2013 about how we use these continuous back of words and skip gram methods in order to learn this representation. So you see where I'm going? We are able, instead of using count-based count uh, feature vectors, we're going to use different representations, which are much more effective representations and much more bio, biologically inspired representations. Uh, how do we do that in uh, using, uh, you know, artificial neural networks or artificial models? Just doing this uh, trick, which is basically masking, having a lot of data input with correct or more or less correct language, and we mask one of the words, and we make a model able to predict what is the word which should be going there. Once you have trained a big enough neural network, which is able to predict the words in their context. And here is the trick. So the trick is uh, words are not isolated things. They are, they are not entities with meaning by themselves. They have to be in the context of other words. Of course, they have to be in the context of the real world. But now, because we are focusing only in language, let's say about con language context. So. What we are doing with these, these uh, approaches, which are what you know 
you know of them, like Warren Beddings or Word to Beck or I don't know, Duck to Beck, many names for the same thing. For word, word uh, neural representation learning. So once we do this, we can get uh, we do this by training uh, a, a neural network model, an artificial one, and of course, as input, we present we, our hot encoding uh, words, outputs the same, and here, we are not interested in the output. What we are learning is the hidden layer. So we are learning a feature map or a feature vector, see? So instead of the traditional method in machine learning where we are humans, the ones in charge of uh, building the feature vectors. We are relying on our neural network to do that. And for that, we need uh, literally billions of words to learn that. Uh, another way, that n-dimensional vector, which is also called the latent uh, codification. It's latent, it's hidden. It's within your brain, within the neural network. Now, uh, with this, uh, came a lot of power. So everyone, if you are from this domain, if you are familiar with this domain, everyone is excited about word to back Google is using word to back Everyone uses embeddings. We want to use, we had a chat before uh, entering here. We were talking about online travel agencies. And I said, oh, you have to use a travel a traveler embedding because we are obsessed uh, about using embeddings because they have a, potentially a good, um, uh, potentially, they have a very powerful effect in terms of being very useful features for predictive tasks, like like the one we have in hand today. Okay, and uh, of course, when they project in this uh, principal component analysis with two dimensions, they project uh, words that are now described as vectors. So the key important point here is one word is not is. Not, not, not only a word now, it's not a one hot encoding uh, one and zeros, it's a fully uh, you know, trained vector with a lot of numbers, maybe 300, 400 dimensions. And when we project these 200 or 300 dimensions onto two dimensions and we see how concepts relate, uh, relate to each other, we can find things like this uh, king and queen, man and uh, woman uh, relationship that, that this meaning and dimensional space represents meaning somehow in a mathematical way. That's what we wanted because we are actually building algorithms that are, are based on mathematics. So the only way to uh, actually actu um, uh, implement this is using mathematics, right? Okay. So basically, just for you to see uh, an example of things that we do with. Uh, this kind of representation is if I have a sample of you know four documents that I have here for, from a different experiment, I can translate that into a 400 dimensional vector, feature vector, that it, it, and it looks like that. And of course, I just show you this to yeah, illustrate that it, it is a black box. It's a black box model because these numbers have been learned from a, in a latent space, in a hidden space from a neural network, and it, they don't have any explicit meaning for, for a human looking at them. But it doesn't mean that it, they are not useful. Yeah. So, of course, in order to see that more intuitive, intuitively, you can see at, the, at that. If we can, as we have a space uh, full of vectors, any word is represented by a vector. We can do operations with these vectors, like summing, subtracting, multiplying, blah, blah, blah. And also, we can calculate distances. So what we discovered, or not we, what, what the, these researchers discovered is like they have, I mean, we have now the possibility of uh, finding a measurement in distance of meaning uh, likeliness, something like that, or similarities, actually. So most similar words to Nino in the Spanish data sets that we have been using is, are these, or things like that. Um, the queen, the ver this is the very, uh, the very typical example made now in Spanish. If I take the word rey, I subtract hombre, and then I add mujer, I get a queen, I get reina. And that kind of uh, operations, uh, they um, 
they show how we are able to manipulate now meaning from a mathematical point of view. And that's very powerful in, in principle, you know, potentially. OK, so now we need one big uh, set of the all possible words in Spanish that can be, you know, uh, represented as a word vector. And for that, we had different, of course, everyone in English is using Glove or other very typical, uh, you know, already trained word to back uh, libraries or data sets, but they are in English. Glove is the one from Stanford and everybody is using that, but it, they don't have a Spanish version. So we have been working with the Spanish 3 billion, uh, Spanish 1 billion. Basically, uh, researchers, they use uh, Wikipedia, news, web crawling in order to get uh, millions and millions and millions of sentences and do this learning by masking and predicting the context of a word, right? So once we have this, now we have another problem. Now we have a, now we need a sequence model because now the, we have the text, we have a long text, maybe or a short text, and the unit of analysis that we have in mind, the, the one that we know, we want to know if it's a, an abuse or a threat or a humiliation, humiliation, then we need to translate that text sequences a sequence of words into, again, a feature vector, a representation. And for that, we can use uh, recurrent, ne recurrent networks like uh, long short and memory networks. So those of you working in deep learning are familiar probably with LSTMs. So we work in, uh, of course, I'm not going to explain that, you know, because we don't have time for that. Uh, we basically, just for you to know that we use in LSTM, we use uh, group cells, and then we also use a by LSTM in which we have to combine lay a forward layer and a backward layer so we can get context in the sentence from the beginning to the end and also backwards. So it's more informative in the, in the sense of modeling what is in uh, in the text itself. What's the meaning conveyed by the, the whole text? So, and... Uh, and that's what we have now, and that's what I'm, in the f last four minutes that I have, I'm going to show you how it works. Or two minutes, I've been saying. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go for that, because of course there's room for improvement. Uh, one way to improve that is to get more data set, uh, to get a, a crowdsourcing approach in which we ask people like you to connect here and say, and rate how, you know, how machista, how, uh, Chauvinist, male chauvinist, this uh, message. And uh, yes, yeah, that's very, mm, very difficult to get a lot of people doing that. So, okay, let's go back and see how it works. Our, uh, so our uh, initial product is called Amaritas, and we have been testing it for some time now. Um, we have testing with these things like electric cars, totally a gay thing, and you can see how the uh, model is able to predict or to classify the tox toxicity. And if you look at the latest label, hate is identity hate. Is how you know the gays as a, um, a group is being hate in this uh, in this sentence. Uh, this is another example for for Spanish. De él han dicho que era un hombre muy tradicional, incluso rancio. El fari. Él se explicaba así. Yo, de todas formas, siempre he detestado al hombre blandengue. ¿De blandengue, man? hombre blandengue. ¿A tal eh, No sé. Y además, eh, también he podido analizar que la mujer tampoco admite al hombre, al hombre blandengue. Además, la mujer es muy pícara, muy pícara valga la palabra. Las pícaras en la audiencia luego pueden comentar. Eh, como bien en otras ocasiones he dicho, eh, yo lo que más valoro en esta vida es la mujer. Es la mujer y para mí tiene un sentido enorme, la vida tiene un sentido enorme con la mujer, sin la mujer la vida no tendría sentido. Pero la mujer es granujilla y se aprovecha mucho del hombre blandengue. No sé. Ok, esto bien, ¿eh? eh. La mujer es granujilla y se aprovecha mucho del hombre blandengue. A, a, a sentence which is almost impossible to translate into English. I tried, I swear. And then, but, but we, use, we wanted to test... Amaritas with a real training set, you know? The train validation test, this is a real test. Fari, el fari is the, the ultimate test. Okay, so I've always detested blandengue men. It's, it's almost impossible to, uh, you know why changing languages is actually changing l culture. And that's why meaning a word to back, you know, the codification if in our brain of words 
it, it depends on the culture we grew up. And that is also true here. So, of course, uh, in this case, we, we are able to, to, to detect insult and toxicity. But it's difficult because of the Blandenge term, which is probably in not included in our word to back vectors. Blandenge was not there. But la mujer es pícara, es mishibus. You can see how we detect the hate towards an identity. In this case, women, insult, also toxicity. Uh, la mujer es granujilla y se aprovecha mucho del hombre Blandenge. Uh, we can see here <laughs> we, how we can also detect the longer the unit is, uh, much better for the model to detect how toxic is the, the text. And this one, I'm not going to slate again, but from our, uh, the, how do you say second division? For second division league or whatever. Uh, yeah, very, very, yeah, almost to the top. You know, one, 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 except threat, except threatening. And yeah, it's very clear. Right, and of course there are things to improve, uh, but we are doing fine with you know distinguishing the nuances in different. Uh, again, this is an example where you can see clearly that it's not about keyword detection. The problem is actually finding these nuances in in the text, and of course we want also to uh, apply these very same methods to other problems like alexithymia, which is the difficulty to identify emotions, uh, kind of the same problem, but a, a different one, just to for you to have a, um, a feeling that we can uh, work with this, uh, with other domains. And also, of course, we'd like to include, that, that's, I, I have fun doing this actually, uh, how we can include also the non-verbal domain. So we're happy to take questions now if we have, I can think we have 15 minutes. And of course, yeah, I test, I, I, I take the opportunity of everything to test our model. So of course, we are happy to take questions in a very you know, kind manner without any abuse. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I don't know. Uh, do we have time for questions? I think I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. If someone has any question, please go ahead. For the business case, have you thought about using it in schools uh, to prevent harassment? And I'm thinking in America, no, I'm preventing it. You see in social networks, Facebook, Twitter, or whatever. Yeah, that that was actually the uh, one thing about the social media is uh, Facebook, Twitter, etc. They are supposed to have their own models, and they have a better position in terms of you know having the training data set, and they're using the their own models. So in that case, we see I, I don't see I don't really I, I find difficulties finding the uh, business case there because it's like um, it's their business case, not mine. That's one way, uh, but the other. Uh, uh, the other domain, schools or communities or, you know, social, I mean, smaller social networks, that could be one. And for that, we need an alliance with the platform platform providers. Uh, we actually didn't explore that yet. In uh, we, we are in that process. We wanted to have the model working first and then going to the platform providers and say, hey, you could use this as an API. So actually what we are working in is, a, is on having a ready to use API that any platform could, could integrate, something like that. Thank you. OK, I don't know if, do you have any more questions? OK, so thank you very much.